actually know much about fandoms or are interested in them. That's just how it is, which is too bad. My other focuses are the LGBTQ community, uh, the Latina community, uh, mostly doing therapy in Spanish, multicultural psychology, and here are some of the diagnoses that I focus on. I think most of you will know what some of these are. Yes? Okay. So, what exactly is mental health? So, having mental health means that you're able to manage the stresses that you have in your life effectively. So what it means is you get a certain amount of stress, you cope with it. If you're able to cope with it effectively, then you have mental, you're, you're healthy, right? But if not, then you might have a mental health diagnosis. You might have some other things going on. Also depends on the environment that you're in. So you could have great coping skills, but if you're in an environment that um, is oppressive or uh, just very stressful to you, maybe abusive, then you might develop a men uh, mental health diagnosis then. Another big part is to be self-actualized. I know this is kind of like a big, um, everyone would like to be, but I don't think many people are. And on the basic, what that means is that your needs need to be met. So I don't know how many of you at least are studying psychology, because the, those of you who are will already know what this is. If you haven't, this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So this is a way of looking at your life and figuring out what needs are being met. The reason why it looks like a pyramid is because in general you can't do one without doing the one under it. I mean, I think the exception is love and belonging. You can definitely have friends even if you're not doing well financially, right? But you might not have as much time to dedicate to them. So I'm just going to start from the bottom. So basic needs. Food, water, sex is included, okay. Uh, sleep, being able to use the restroom effectively, things that you might take for granted, but if someone has a chronic he uh, health illness, these are things that might be very difficult for them, okay. And if you have something that's going on in your physical health, then your mental health is going to suffer as well. Then safety, are you actually safe for your living? And this can mean many things. You have a job that actually pays enough that you can pay the rent, for those of you in the Bay, you know that's a big deal. Um, how is your family doing? How is your health, right? Then we go up to love and belonging. So that is not only just having friends and family, but also feeling that you have a community, that you have people who support you, and being actually able to dedicate time to those relationships, because relationships are not easy. Besides for that, then you go up to self-esteem. So getting your self-esteem, confident, being respected by other people, feeling that you are making some sorts of achievements in your life. And then the last one, which is self-actualization, which like I said, I don't think many people can actually achieve it, it's very difficult, would be complete acceptance. It's kind of like being very mindful, um, not having prejudice, having a good sense of morality, and also being creative, which a lot of people forget to include. So you're at a place where all of your basic needs are being met, and you're just a generally good person. You, ha you may have stressors happening to you, but you're able to manage them effectively. Does that make sense to everyone? So this is the goal that everyone kind of strives to get to, okay? So, I wanted to at least give you a little bit on what mental health looks like on the positive side. On the other side, there are some diagnoses that people in this room might have. So for example, depression, anxiety, social phobia, being on the autism spectrum, um, having ADHD, and PTSD. Does everyone know what the two on the bottom mean? Yeah. Yes? Okay. All right, good. Yeah. I figure that most people know these acronyms, but if anyone ever has a question on something I say, please interrupt and let me know. So, okay, you have a diagnosis. What does that actually mean? Does it mean that there's something wrong with you? No. Mm -hmm. So ADD doesn't technically exist anymore. Yeah, I mean, people still use it commonly, but um, it's what it was called two DSMs ago. So we have like this, um, diagnostic book that we use to diagnose people. So two versions ago we used ADD. So that's, does that make sense? 
For those of you who play Dungeons and Dragons, I don't know if this will make sense, so you know how the player handbook has upgrades, right? So you might be playing something on the number one, which people are going to be like, what are you talking about? So it's kind of like that. Every time a new handbook comes out, you can still use the old terminology, but it's not really used anymore. But it's the same thing. Yeah, no problem. So if you have a diagnosis, it means that you are an individual who has symptoms of that diagnosis. And the reason why I'm making that distinction is because a lot of times people start to think that they are their label. So they start taking it to heart. Might be something that you're taking on yourself, but many times it's people around you, even including providers, who will start to refer to you as, well, you, were you, were you depressed, or you're anxious, or your family will be like, well, you're always sad, you're always angry. And you start to believe that these symptoms are who you are, but they're not. It's kind of like if you had a cold and someone told you that your sneeze is your identity. Like, that's how it is to me. It doesn't make any sense, right? So if you start looking at mental health in a way that is more the way people look at physical health, it's a little bit easier to differentiate between yourself and your diagnoses, okay? So I'm going to start with the positive and then we'll end with the more difficult stuff. So here are some ways that being a brony can actually help you with your mental health. Keeping yourself healthy and also helping you manage symptoms that you might already have. So one, and I just like this gift, so sorry that's distracting. <laughs> um, one is that you can have a community you actually talk to. Whether we get into flame wars or whatever we're doing online, in general, there's normally someone you can hang out with in the brony community regardless of the drama, okay? <laughs> it helps you to make more friends and connections. Just the fact that you're all here at a convention talking to new people, doing new things, it makes a difference. Because sometimes when you have a mental health diagnosis, it's hard to even get out and interact with other people and do new things. So just coming here is a big deal. Also, watching the show can lower your level of stress. Why? Because it's a good show, one. And also because you're happy when you're watching it. It's a fun show, it has good positive values, and it helps you to distract a little bit from the stressors that you're facing, right? So this is how being a brony can actually be helpful. And one of the reasons um, that lowering your stress is so important is because, so for example, if you already have a mental health diagnosis with certain symptoms, the more stressed out you are, the worse those symptoms are going to get. So you have to lower your level of stress so that the symptoms will affect you less. It doesn't mean they're going to go away. Many people have um, chronic mental health diagnosis. There's nothing wrong with that. It's more figuring out how to manage them. So if you can find a way to lower your level of stress on a daily basis, your other symptoms are going to be easier to manage. Does that make sense? It's kind of like, um, what's the metaphor? Like, you know, a cup that's full of water, if it's already to the top and you add more, one more drop, it overflows, right? But if you actually have it about halfway or lower, you add a drop, it doesn't, it doesn't have the same effect. Think of your mental health like that. I mean, we all have our limits. So you need to figure out how to lower your level of stress, how to make yourself um, in, a, in as good a place as you can so that when those things happen or maybe your symptoms get worse, they're just easier to handle. That makes sense to everybody. So another way that it can help, I mean, I don't know why it says lesion, so ignore that spelling error. This is what happens when you spell check out in the middle of the night. Um, <laughs> so pro positive lessons is what I meant. Okay, well, that's the first thing I noticed. Um, basically watching the show, you can learn positive lessons, you can learn about friendship, learn about self-esteem and self-worth, and just ignore the other typo I see right there with and. <laughs> also, maybe you're creative. Maybe you're someone who likes doing fan art or fan fiction or music. So doing something creative can also help lower your level of stress and just make you happier. It also gives you an outlet. So when you have a lot of energy and you're really stressed out, let's say you have an anxiety disorder, Putting your energy into something is really helpful because that energy from your anxiety is already there. I mean, you, it's, it's really hard to get rid of it, but you can definitely focus it into something else or distract yourself from it so you're not thinking about the same thing over and over again, which is what happens when you're anxious. And also, it can increase your self-worth. I mean, it's nice when you make something creative and someone else comes over and it's like, oh, that looks cool, I like that. And you can kind of get that positive feedback from other people or just feel that you're increasing your skills. So the fact that maybe you like drawing, the more you draw, the better you get at it. Same with everything else. 
So, <laughs> this is my favorite GIF, by the way, it'll keep going. <laughs> so what about stigma? <laughs> I can't help laughing at it. Um, so what is stigma exactly? Some of you might know, some of you may not. So stigma is basically, this is like dictionary definition, a mark of disgrace associated with a particular circumstance, quality, or person. So, as many of you know, the Brony community has plenty of stigma from all places, right? Not only from people who aren't in any fandom, but actually people from other fandoms as well. And, or people even in the MLP fandom, which is, yeah, even worse. So, <laughs> there's plenty of stigma of you just saying that you're a Brony. And so, unfortunately, even though you're watching a show that makes you happy, you've met more friends through it, you just enjoy the show, now you have this added thing to it that's like, wait, the thing that actually should be relaxing me is stressing me out. Because now other people are judging me, they're making comments, um, and I don't know what to do. Do I just, you know, kind of like not tell anyone I'm a brony, which is what some people do? Do I tell them and, you know, whatever deal? Like, what are your options there? So, even in the, <laughs> in the mental health community, stigma towards the brony community is actually really bad. So one of the reasons why I wanted to give this presentation is because I've been someone who's been on the other side for, for quite a while hearing all of this and I thought to myself, I don't think that that community actually knows what is being said of them over here. Because these, well, <laughs> these are in like private conversations, private-ish, and like national psychologist listservs that are happening about the Bronin community. And yet, I can see by your faces, most of you don't even know this is happening. So there are plenty of mental health professionals who are very confused by the existence of Bronies and are very prejudiced towards the group. And so it's important for you to know what some of these, unfortunately, negative things are, so that when you're seeking mental health, you aren't taken by surprise by someone who maybe doesn't treat you with respect. Does that make sense to everyone? So, I mean, people are just afraid of what they don't understand. I mean, yeah, no, that's like the classic thing, it's true. They're ignorant, they don't, a lot of people in the mental health community do, are really are not in any fandom. Um, there's very few, so they don't even know what that means. There's a lot of judgment, and there's a lot of anger, ironically. <laughs> I don't know why. So, it turns into this kind of like battle of like, I don't know, what these bronies are, who they are, why, why they're coming to me with this issue when it's a non-issue, to name some things that I've heard. And so I'm, gonna, I'm giving you real commentary, and so I hope that you're able to handle it as best as you can. So this is actual commentary that I've had from other therapists and psychologists when we've talked about this. My Little Pony, is that that girl show from the 80s? It's common. Men like it, why? Are they gay? Are all of them gay? That's, the, that's like the first or second question I get asked. And when I say, actually, I don't think so. And even if they were, it doesn't really matter. But OK, thanks. Um, it continues. They aren't a real community deserving of our attention. This one's really popular. So most people in the mental health field don't consider fandoms to be something that's worth really their time. They don't really get it, they don't consider it to be a group, so they just ignore it. So often they'll make comments like, oh yeah, they like some sort of show, I don't know what they're talking about. Like, which is a big deal, because when you're going to a mental health provider, and it's someone who's not gonna take a part of your life that might be a very big part of your life seriously, then what does that mean for your relationship? Um, this one's the worst. This is actually a much longer conversation that happened in the lift serve where I was kind of fighting with someone in a professional way. <laughs> but basically, we should treat them like gay people since they're similar in many ways. So first of all, that sentence has plenty of issues already. <laughs> because who is talking about how we should treat all gay people the same too? Whatever. And I asked them why. It was much... <laughs> I then went into a whole dialogue with them, but, well, you know, they're pretty feminine. I mean, they wear those pink shirts, so they're probably getting bullied because they look gay, is actually what the guy ended up saying, and I'm like, so this is from people who have actually been in the field for a long time. I'm not talking about um, psychology students or people new to the field. These are licensed professionals, okay? Like, what, what comes to your own mind when you, when you see that this is what that community is saying about the Bronin community, like, you might think, are you surprised by the comments? Yes. So, hmm? Depends on your degree how much they're being paid. But the person who made the comment is getting paid quite a bit. <laughs> Just from what I know. Um, yeah. 
treat someone differently if you recognize that they're part of a legitimate Yes. So I don't know if everyone heard his question. It was, um, if you're treated, this one? Is this a little better for everyone? <laughs> I also talk kind of low, so I'm sorry. Um, the question was, is there a benefit in being seen as a legitimate community is kind of what you said. So yes, the reason why is because the American Psychological Association really pushes for us to be uh, accepting of diversity, um, to be multicultural, and that's, that's part of our Essex code. Now, how it plays out in the field varies, to be honest. But if, the, if bronies or even fandoms were considered to be legitimate communities, there would be at least more of a movement for education and for people not to feel so okay making these really outrageous statements and not even taking a moment to think, oh, that's probably not the best thing I could have said. Does that make sense? So I think that there is value in it. Even if there was just acknowledgement of hey, there are many people who are in many fandoms and we need to recognize that that's a, that's a culture in itself. Even that larger culture would be better than now when the comments are either that or like, oh, I don't really understand. They say they play some online game, I don't know. Like, there's no connection. See what I mean? Yeah. So, what about other people? Like, are you really surprised to hear some of these comments? What are your reactions when you start thinking about this is how people are seeing this community? Go ahead. It sounds almost like the fifth grade bully. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why it's disappointing, because it's coming from people who you would, I, I mean, I guess I hope and expect that they would act a little bit better than that. Go ahead. Right, well, so you're saying like they'd be more hesitant and like seeking services type of thing? Yeah. Well, but this is what I mean. So there's already plenty of stigma going on from other fandoms. Then when you take it to this place where like, okay, I'm having some, some struggles, I have a mental health diagnosis, I'm going to someone who's supposed to be helping me, do they, are they even accepting that I'm in this community and what are their thoughts about it? Where's your question? I kind of feel like in that aspect, the people who, the, the mental health professionals that are saying these things, um, are maybe a little bit, I would almost say, too far removed from the people that they've worked with, they treat, the, that's the correct phrasing, on a yeah. daily basis. Because if you look at every single person, no matter what, they're going to have something that they are a massive fan of. And it doesn't matter whether it's a TV show, a specific type of movie, a director, music, it doesn't matter what it is. But yeah. the fact that they're saying things like that shows to me that they're not really paying attention to the fact that that's a very pivotal part of everyone's life, no matter what it is. Right. And we just have to focus in on... On ponies. ponies. <laughs> Which there's nothing wrong with ponies. So uh, there's a little bit more of legitimacy, or that's what they give to people who are fans of like music. So let's say if you're working in a department where everyone works with children, which is actually what I'm, what I'm doing now. Uh, let's say someone really likes One Direction, for example. It is not uncommon for a clinician to say, oh, you know what, I should really watch some of their music videos and listen to the music so I know what they're talking about. So it's interesting that they do that with music, most people, but they won't do it with other things. That doesn't happen with video games, it doesn't happen with ca cartoons, it doesn't happen with TV shows, rarely. So I don't know what the disconnect is. I do sometimes wonder if we're still kind of on this um, mentality of psychology back in the day where we're not really taking into account media. So we're not really seeing that how it impacts people. Yeah. Do you think maybe some of it has to do with just the time frame that the physicians have to be able to actually study up on this kind of thing? Obviously, it's a lot yeah. easier to look at uh, a three-minute YouTube video of a couple of, you know, a music video versus sitting through, you know, a bunch of movies from one director or looking at, you know, watching you know, hours upon hours. That's true. But I think they have enough time to watch an episode. It's 20 minutes. So, or to at least read up on it, or to maybe reach out to people who they know know about it, like me, for example. I don't hide that I'm a brony. There are plenty of ponies in my office, so it's pretty obvious. Um, yeah. And there are some other clinicians that actually do this, but no, they, there's, 
I think unless you're in a hospital setting, like uh, Kaiser, for example, sadly, people there really don't have a lot of time because mental health pro providers don't really get much support in that system. Um, but most other places are not like that. And we do have time. And actually, we can bill for time that we're doing research for you. So, <laughs> so this is stuff that you should know. So I can actually bill if I'm watching a TV show as long as I can prove that I'm doing it to relate better to you. But they just don't do it. I saw a question in the back for a while from Charlie. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> Mm-hmm. You can't find that out from watching a show, and you can't find out yes. about the Romney movement, or the submit, et cetera, or the reason, the biggest reasons people are involved in it until you ask them. Right. And as a behaviorist, you've got too many people going your direction to the movies. You can't really follow them. But the basic premise that someone is disturbing to me, that people who are supposed to be behaviorists and observe behavior and find out what makes people tick aren't even bothering to ask them. Right, and so that's the part that concerns me because I've seen it happen more with this community. People who are good mental health providers, they don't do that. They actually do try to listen to the person. And regardless of if they have time to watch the show or not, they have a much more inquisitive mind. So that's what you're saying. Right, that's very easy. But instead, there are p quite a few people who make all these assumptions and then never actually talk to the, the patient or the client. So. Um, and so one of the questions I had up here is, and don't worry, I'll have, we'll have time for questions at the end as well. How can you, so how can you really have faith in, the, in, in mental health providers when you're afraid that they're going to judge you? And I say this because this is a fear that I think happens across the board. When you're seeing someone for mental health, it's already stressful to go in and start telling someone all of your personal secrets. But then when you think, oh, I'm, I'm kind of in different groups and I don't even know if they know what they are and do I really want to sit here and explain this to them? Are they going to judge me? It adds another level of anxiety that I don't think needs to be there. Does that make sense? But like she was saying before, I mean, there, there are great mental health providers who will not do that. It's just hard to know until you meet someone what's going to happen. You have a question? Yeah. They could be, but see, that's, that's, that's your decision, right? Because someone else might find that to be comforting. Yeah, I would, I would, I would, I would hope that the person could somehow separate it out. Well, so here's the thing. Just because you're in a fandom, you, that doesn't mean that you're going to be talking about ponies the whole session. That would be extremely inappropriate. Does that make sense? That would, that would not, no. So even, and I love ponies. Um, I rarely talk about it in session unless the person brings it up. See? So, or if it has to do with what's going on, maybe I'll say, oh, you know, you're, I know you're having a really r rough week. We talked that you like My Little Pony. I know there's a new episode coming out this week. Can that be one of the ways that you can relax? See what I mean? So I use it in that sense. And I do put ponies in my office, among other fandom things. Small things, it's not covered. So that people know, oh, okay, at least she knows something. Because if not, she wouldn't have, like, this random video game character thing. You see what I mean? Um, but no, it should never turn into something where your mental health provider is talking to you more about themselves than you. Like that's, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. I think that's a little different. So being a professional means that you shouldn't be putting, it means that the needs of the patient become in front of your own needs. So when I'm seeing someone, I shouldn't be meeting my needs of wanting to talk about things because it's their time. That wouldn't make any sense. You know, but you can definitely use the knowledge you have in a way that's productive, but you have to know how to, how to do that. Yeah, there has to be a boundary, of course. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about 
how can you select a provider? So when I say provider, I mean a counselor, a therapist, psychologist, a social worker, any of the above. So, honestly, sometimes it's helpful just to find someone who is open to different communities and cultures. So just when you, and this has just been my experience, but I've noticed that therapists who focus on multicultural cultural psychology or the LGBTQ community or any subgroups like um, the BDSM or King community, for those of you who may know what that is, there are therapists who focus on that. Yes, <laughs> I see some approval. And my point is that when you find therapists who are open to different lifestyles or different ways of being or just different identities, it's more likely that they'll be perfectly fine with whatever fandom you're in most of the time. And the reason why is because they're already working with communities that are very, um, can be ha experiencing a lot of prejudice and uh, like segregation, if that makes sense. There's a question in the back, I think, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Right, no, so gender is actually a pretty common um, way to select a provider, and there's nothing wrong with that. So if you want a provider from a certain gender, it's always okay to ask. Yes, now that being said, if the therapist um, realizes that maybe you selecting that is not the best for your growth, they might tell you. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, I do think that there, there are a lot of providers in the Bay Area, and there's plenty of providers in other places, but I'm just talking about the Bay. So here, you really have a wide selection of people. You really do. So don't ever feel that you're, like, stuck with someone um, and that you have to not pick someone who fits who you are. So... I wanted to talk about a little other things that are important. So first of all, finding someone who works in uh, a variety of communities, but also someone who actually works with the diagnosis that you have. So what some people don't um, realize is, for example, let's say you've already been diagnosed with something and you've been, you've been working with that throughout your life. It would be helpful for you to find a provider that specializes in that because we don't all specialize in the same diagnoses. Some of us are generalists and kind of deal with a lot of different stuff, but that doesn't mean that we're gonna that we have a lot of experience in your diagnosis um, that you've been working on. And you can always ask if they're familiar with fandoms. You can actually ask. I mean, at worst, they're just gonna be like, "What?" and then you have your answer. <laughs> but it's okay. Also, interview them. So when you're looking for someone to help you with your mental health, it's important to know that you're interviewing them because you're the one who's paying them. So try to see it that way. Because I notice that sometimes when people are selecting providers, they don't really see it that way and they feel like they have to get whoever they um, are given. But in reality, you should pick a provider that you trust, someone that you feel comfortable with. Also, are they going to respect you? Do you feel that they're able to listen to you? And even if they mess up and disrespect you at some point, can they own that and actually apologize for it? And is it someone that you can see weekly and work together? Keep in mind, most therapy is weekly. So you need to think, am I willing to see this person every week for an hour? Do I think this is really going to work? So the reason why I'm saying this is because um, it's to give you more empowerment and to know that you can make these decisions for yourself. So I know that that was kind of like a brief thing because I wanted to leave most of the time for questions because I thought that would be more helpful. For me, it was kind of, I was unsure what the needs would be of everyone coming to see this panel and so that's why I want to leave plenty of time to, ask, to a answer questions. So what questions do people have or like, is there anything I didn't touch upon that you'd like me to talk about? Sure, in the back. Yeah. Part of that's because they can't understand that a man being part of a fandom is more than just having a hobby or they're just looking at fandom because he's doing obsessed with a hobby or something. I, I kind of think, it, think it's both a little bit. I think there could be an uh, understanding of, okay, that person likes a show that doesn't, 
there, that there might not be much thought past that. Or people might think that they're very uh, like obsessed with the show and that's kind of it. But they don't realize that every fandom has its own culture and community. Everyone has their own language and fandom. And people, you can tell what fandom they're in depending on what they talk about, right? And even the words that they use or where they hang out, basically. So the reason why it can be helpful for the provider to at least be open to listening to you or knowing about that is so that you can have um, a wider breadth of conversation with them. Does that make sense? Yeah. What other questions do people have about mental health in general or mental health for bronies specifically or anything like that? Go ahead. What advice do you have for if, how can a fan know if perhaps the fan is doing too much of their I actually think that's why it's helpful to have a mental health provider that you trust, right? And someone who can actually differentiate between, okay, this is a show you enjoy, you're getting uh, like something out of it that's positive, and okay, this is going into the realm of you're only doing things related to the show, kind of like what was, what was said earlier. You're only doing things related to the show, you're actually letting other things fall on the wayside, like maybe you're not going to work because you're at home watching episodes, I don't know. Or um, you're ignoring your friends uh, in real life because you're uh, only chatting to people online, which there's not to take away from that relationship, but you also need to actually interact with people, right? So there's certain things that could be noticeable. It, it, it makes me think of like addiction, like that's the way I'd look at it. If it starts to look more like an addiction than a fandom, then that's when I'd be worried. Does that answer your question? Yeah. As a friend, you mean? Yeah. I, I think that's really tough if you're trying to intervene with a friend that you're worried about. It depends on how strong the friendship is like anything else. So if you want to actually confront them about it nicely, you can, but I don't know that they'll hear you. Right? So it depends. It, it, it's like any other, I, I would treat it like other addictions in the sense of you can tell the person, hey, I'm worried about you. Uh, here are the reasons why. They may or may not listen to you, or they may actually listen to you later on, as in that might actually stay in their mind and it might affect them later. But you can't change what they're doing. See what I mean? So if it's really bad or some other stuff is going on, you can recommend that they see a mental health provider. That's always helpful. You don't have to have a diagnosis to come see us. You can, you can just come and chat about day-to-day -day stressors or whatever it is that's going on in your life. Yeah. Did you have another question, Charlie? I saw you a while ago, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> Right. It's really behind because even, so like I said earlier, another focus of mine is video games. Video games have been around for a long time, right? There is very little research about video games and most of it's negative, which doesn't make much sense to me. So, and video games have been around since what, 70s, 80s or before, if you think about like home consoles. So the brony movement is so new that I have not seen much research. There is one person, he was here last year, who was trying to do, I, don't, I forget what his, what his doctorate is in, but he was trying to actually get data um, and looking at kind of like positive so social interactions from what I can remember. But besides for him, I don't know of anyone else, which is too bad, right? So, right. No, and same here. I've mostly heard personal accounts, and I wish there was research, but I, I don't know of any so far. So, go ahead. I would say that the gentleman that you are speaking about is here. We'll be doing another panel. I think we'll do this tomorrow. Okay. But my question I did have for you was, being that you do work, you know, that you do have a knowledge of the fandom and dealing yeah. with the people that you do, have you dealt with a lot of people that have uh, PTSD and what kind of, what the show has done to move them in a more positive direction? I haven't had bronies with PTSD yet. I have definitely had people in other fandoms have PTSD. So 
it's tough because the, the fandoms I'm thinking are of more TV shows like uh, Supernatural or um, what's the other vampire one? Teen, Teen Wolf and Vampire Diaries. Yeah, all those. So most of it have been people who either watch those shows or like science fiction or fantasy novels. It's helpful for people who have PTSD to have something they can do to distract themselves if they're having a flashback or they're getting really overwhelmed. But if you're watching or reading something that is similar in nature to what you experience, like Supernatural is not the best thing to be watching when you're having an episode if you have PTSD. It's kind of balancing, okay, I know you love the show. Is it time to give it a break right now? Because for those of you who watch Supernatural, I mean, they get kind of tortured quite often. So, so someone who has post-traumatic stress disorder, like that's not the best show to be watching. And so I have definitely recommended for people to give it a break until they stabilize. On the other hand, I've encouraged them to maybe read more novels that, they, that they're pretty sure is not gonna go into that subject to distract themselves. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. It turned a lot of my life in a really positive manner. I was wondering if that was something that they haven't seen. Uh, you know, but whether by you or by any other studies that have done time. I haven't found studies about it, but I have definitely heard a lot of vets. I've, I've seen a lot of it online, so I haven't had people come in the door, but I've, there, there seems to be a pretty big vet community that's in the Brony community from what I've heard, right? And what people have said is same as you, that it actually helps them relax because it's such a lighthearted show that it's a really um, good contrast to everything else that's going on. So if I were to work with someone who had PTSD and was a Brony, I'd probably use it as a way for them to lower their level of stress before or after session if we're talking about intense things because you have to work through it, right? So that can be a good way of being like, okay, today's session was really heavy. I'd like you to go home and watch an episode that you really enjoy and not think about the session anymore. Does that make sense? So there's ways that you can integrate any fandom into helping someone improve. Okay? There's some questions over here. Go ahead. So there's these stigmas about this fandom. Yeah. I think, I think it's the way that you talk about it, so it's hard to explain. Um, I'm lucky in the sense that because of my background, I can talk about uh, My Little Pony in a way that makes a lot more sense to someone who's academic. So I, so I can definitely use a lot of theory and different research to back up what I'm saying, even if there's no research about bronies. See what I mean? So people will normally take me a little bit more seriously because I'm not talking to them as a fan, I'm talking to them as a professional. See? But from a fan's point of view, I think just being secure in yourself and just giving yourself a voice. Does that make sense? So just being someone who can actually say, yes, I like this show, and you know what? It's helpful to me. It doesn't like it, so. Does that, so that would be a way for you to combat it. Um, there's also advocacy, but I'm not sure what that would look like. Um, I know that one of the things that me and the, the few people I know who are into different fandoms, what we try to do is we teach some of the psychology students about fandoms before they even see clients, actually. And so then we and we also do workshops and whatnot for professionals. So that's what I do on the other end. I'm not sure how to do that from someone in the fandom. I wonder if you could do the same thing. Some agencies are actually pretty open to having people come in and talk. Um, but it's tough because there's not enough legitimacy, like you said earlier, of this community for that to happen. You see what I'm saying? So it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Feeling isolated in the fandom? Or just... Yeah, in those cases, I definitely push for people to be online more, actually. Um, because at least online you can find a community. And so even though the people around you might not be accepting, you can find a really good community in different forums or websites and things like that. But it's tough because that doesn't really solve the problem of not having any friends you can see in person, right? And talk about the show or even have a place to be open. But I mean, I think that happens for a lot of marginalized communities, that if you're in a small town or a place that's not very accepting, that's how it's gonna be. And unfortunately, it's just working through the stress in however you can. So it's not, there's not really a good answer, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so I'm curious, 
so I have a friend who is depressed, and, yeah. uh, and the person is rather preserved. Um, uh, kind of trying to keep away from kind of new things. And I feel like um, like the show would be like a great booster, but I'm not sure if I should show my friend um, like from the beginning or I should show him to do it. Of a more like I mean, I don't know. That's really up to you, but it, I mean, it, I don't think the episode choice matters as much. What matters more is that you as a friend are trying to reach out to him or her and basically showing them that um, this is something that helps me. I feel better when I watch it. Why don't you just try it out? If you don't like it, that's fine, but you can try, right? Because it'd be great if they would get involved in something that is more uplifting like this show. And then there, there is also more opportunity for someone who's depressed to try new things if you're in a fandom, because then you might actually want to go to a convention, for example, or you might want to join a new community online or do something new. Like having a hobby or having something that you're, that you're interested in helps, helps people who are suffering from depression. Does that make sense? So it doesn't really matter even what show or what you have, what you help them be involved in. The important thing is that they're involved in anything. See what I mean? Okay. There's a question in the back. Um, yeah. Uh, I was wondering, how surprised were you when you found out your colleagues? Because I was surprised because I was surprised every other week. Yeah. Yeah. I was somewhat surprised, but not really. And I, I think it's because I, I work with a lot of communities that um, have a lot of prejudice towards them. So a lot of the training I've had is working with that, uh, even with other professionals. Does that make sense? So. I think I was more disappointed. I wasn't surprised I was disappointed. And I was pissed, to be quite blunt. So it, it just turned into, OK, how can I professionally tell them that I don't agree with them? I'm not going to use any other language here. But, and that's what I did. And actually, I'm lucky that I have good mentors who, even though they don't understand the My Little Pony fandom, they definitely support that I'm trying to find um, more like more advocacy for that group. So I was able to go to people who've been in the field for a long time, who, who most of them are in the LGBT community, so they were around back in like um, the rights movements from back in the day. So they were able to really help me and be like, you know, I don't really understand the community, but I believe you, and here are some things you can do. Um, yeah, but it was just disappointing, and I hear comments all the time. But on the plus side, I've had people come up to me later who have said, you know, now that you've talked and presented about what it means to be a brony, which is a very different presentation than what you all saw, because you don't need to know what a brony mean, what it means, um, who have come to me later and be like, you know, I had a very different idea of what that meant, and now I, I see that it can be something really positive, and I appreciate that you brought it up. So I've had people who have actually been able to understand that. There's, so there's some hope there. It just depends on the person. Yeah. Sure. Um, I know that this fandom has a really interesting way that it's not referring to gender stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And you say that like, there's not much research in it in the mental health field. Do you think that's going to have a positive impact on the way we look at gender stereotypes, or like, maybe change the way we look at them? Yeah, I think, it, I think it can, because that seems to be what throws people off the most, right? The, like the weird comment about if they're gay or, and the whole like feminine, like it's just bizarre to me. But the thing is, I don't think that the gender movement is that great in psychology yet either. It's doing much better, but for someone who's trans or not just non-binary, non it can also be hard to find a therapist who understands that. So if that community, which has been around for quite a long time. I mean, around and visible, I should say. Then, I, I, I don't know. I'm not entirely surprised that they're treating Bernie's the same. That being said, maybe it's a way for people to be like, oh, there's these people who are straight men, because apparently this is more legitimizing, I don't know, um, who like this show. Oh, OK. That's, that's, maybe it's a different generation, I've heard that comment, which is at least somewhat better than you know being derogatory, I guess. So, I don't know. I feel like um, it can work together with gender studies and where we're at, but we're not in a great place yet. Yeah. Was there a question in the back somewhere? Yeah. I apologize if this is too well formulated. You talked about professionals, other mental health professionals being uh, willfully ignorant or dismissive about the industry. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, from the, for not for the Brony community, but I've seen that um, for the BDSM and King community, which is a different community. I've definitely heard the no, that's wrong, or we're not going to talk about that. Um, for the Brony community, it's more dismissing, is what I've had. So either people make rude comments, but they're more like, well, that doesn't really matter. I don't really understand. I don't really care. That's more of the comment I get. But like I said, there are people in the profession who are not like that, who are at least open to hearing about it and can respond by saying, okay, maybe that's something I need to look into, or okay, I understand that's a community. I don't really get it, but I understand that that's a community that exists. So, are there any other questions that people may have? Sure, <laughs> sure, go ahead. Yeah. Is it okay to do that in a positive way? Like for a long for quite a while now I've looked at ADHD as being a part of myself and I'm very happy. Mm -hmm. It depends, yeah, I, I know what you're saying. It depends on the person. So some people find it very validating and empowering, in fact, to say this is the diagnosis I have. Um, I can see people who would say, I find it empowering to say this is a part of me, because it is. I think what I'm trying to say is I don't want that to be, I always get scared when people see their label as that's all that they are, which is different. There's a difference between saying I have a diagnosis and it's a part of who I am and I'm proud of it, and you know what, that's fine then saying I am this diagnosis, that's all I am, and there's nothing. Like, th see, th those are the two differences that I, that's why I try to have people not connect to their label, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. Are there any other things that you all wish that I would have talked about today or, or questions that are still kind of lingering from the, I know it's like a really short, um, for, for a very large topic. Sure, in the back. I couldn't hear the last part of what you said. I, it's about the, I, I would say it's about the same. Um, the difference is, on my end, I've, I perceive it to be more helpful than some other fandoms. So it seems like I've heard more stories of people in the Brony community using this show as something positive, something that can actually help alleviate symptoms. I might not hear that as much at an anime convention, for example. Does that make sense? So I find this community to be, as a whole, despite some of the issues we might have with each other at times, much more supportive and positive. So for me, me, I'm actually really happy when clients are involved in the, in the Brony community, not just because I like ponies, but because I know the show well enough to be like, okay, that's actually a really positive thing to be involved with. And like we were talking earlier about PTSD, I don't have to necessarily worry about the person being triggered or some other negative things that happen when you watch different shows. So I don't think the prevalence is any more or any less. It's about the same, no matter what. You had a question? <laughs> that, that, that's a whole another furry or non-furry? Both? <laughs> well, about the same. Um, there's more of a negative stereotype if you're a furry. I know people here might... I mean, brony and furry, we're not that far apart, I'm just saying. So, <laughs> and I'm in both communities, so take that as you will. Right, that's what people think, yes. So people mostly think it's a sexual thing for furries. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and for, for better or worse, I have not heard people who, in the mental health community that I've interacted with know about that much. But that does happen with the furry community because they're more visible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, and it's but it's kind of it's kind of frustrating that you even have to explain it, isn't it? You know. Well, and and that uh, I'll come back to your point in a minute because I realized I didn't finish answering it. Okay, but I, I will say that I think that's what happens in the mental health community too, at least in, for psychologists. There are a lot of younger psychologists, but I'm in my early 30s and I'm considered to be a younger psychologist. So if you think about that, it makes a lot more sense because we're talking about people who are a few generations um, older than us, right? Right. And what, what I mean is that they had their own struggles, and this isn't something that was a part of their culture. The same thing's going to happen to us when we get older. That's the reality. We'll be talking about ponies, and they'll be talking about something we don't really understand. So, so it, it's a normal part of, of, of aging, I think. But I, I want to go back to your point about kind of like the biases with um, costume, like like cosplay and furries. So. I have, so with cosplayers, it's more of an indifference kind of thing, like, okay, people like dressing up, I don't get it, I don't care. Furries, I've definitely heard a lot more, um, it's very sexualized, that's all they know. Many, not, this is just a generalization, and that's what they assume. So when I've had talks with other providers about the furry community, they're surprised that I don't even talk about the sexual side to it, because I don't have to, they already know about that part. I tell them about everything else. And often they're like, oh wait, so it's not just a sex thing. No, it's, it's not just a sex thing. But it, it comes down to if you're not involved in the community, why would you, there's no way that they would know. All they know is like stuff that you see in the media and whatnot. Yeah. So is, is there a separation for them between like Halloween and Apparently there is for most people. I mean, right? Most people don't really understand cosplay in general. I mean, if you, take, if you go outside the fandom is what I mean, not in a fandom. So... I know we're getting close to time, so does anyone have like a last minute question? I'll be here for a few minutes afterwards as well. No? Okay. Go ahead. I think it helps me because it just makes me a lot happier to watch the show. <laughs> no, let's be honest. I mean, it's a tough job, okay? I, I love my job, but it's also very difficult. And, um, if I'm having a rough day that I've seen a lot of patients who are just struggling a lot and you have to hold all of that energy in you, I'll watch My Little Pony when I get home because I need to relax. So there's that. Also, I have some of the stuff in my office isn't just to let people know it's okay to talk about ponies. It's also because I like having it in my office. Like I have like a tiny little Twilight, like that Funko doll thing. Anyway, and she is definitely what I look, look at when I'm, when I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed because she's the character that I associate my psychology self with. But um, that's how I feel that it's helped me. You know, does that make sense? Yeah. So I'm gonna put up um, my information if anyone wants to, I'll be here too, but if anyone wants to contact me. So this is my email. It's pretty easy, except my last name's pretty hard to spell, and I didn't realize that. Um, you can email me at any time. And then right now, um, I'm actually working in San Jose at uh, Asian Americans for Community Involvement. So because I'm working in community mental health, we only see people who have Medi-Cal. But if for some reason you have Medi-Cal or want to contact me, I have my, um, my actual business cards up here too, okay? And thank you so much for everyone for coming in and asking questions. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.